Well, welcome to this video where we're thinking about the upper airways. If we just turn our model over, we can see a rather nice sagittal section of the head here. Now let's just give ourselves some orientation first. Here we have the bone of the skull, front of the brain, frontal lobes, back of the brain, occipital areas of the brain. This is the cerebellum, corpus callosum, uh, this is the brain stem, continuous with the spinal cord going down here. And here we see the vertebrae. This is actually C1 here, the first vertebrae, which is the atlas. Then this is C2. This is the dens of the, the axis vertebrae, sometimes called the odontoid peg. And that makes that C3, cervical vertebrae 3, 4, 5, 6 and seven. So this gives us a reference point for the structures of the airway actually. We can see what level they are. So this is level C3, C4, C5, C6, C7. Now we're looking at the upper airway. So let's just look at it as a whole first of all. So the air is going to come in through the, uh, through the nostrils there, through the nasal cavities, and it joins this tube at the back called the pharynx. But we can see that the air can also get through the mouth. So this is the oral cavity here. It will join in the pharynx here. And then the airway actually goes anteriorly. It goes to the front. So this is the front of the neck here, obviously. And this is the airway. This is the trachea. So the air has to come down here and then it kind of has to go forward a bit and it goes down anteriorly into the trachea. Because what we have here at the back Behind the trachea, this is the food pipe. This is the esophagus. So that's the way the air goes through the nasal passage passages, through the oral cavity, depending on whether you're breathing through your mouth or your nose or both, joining at the back here in the pharynx and then going always down the trachea here. Now the trachea, this airway tube here at the bottom, is the only way air gets in and out of the lungs. So absolutely vital that this remains open, otherwise we asphyxiate, we can't breathe. But let's now go in and detail, look at a little more detail of these uh, structures related to the airway specifically. Now, we've noticed that that is the nostril there, that's the way in, the way the air gets in. And the nostrils, of course, there's two, and these are called the external nares the way into the nasal cavity here. And then at the front of the nasal cavity, the skin actually goes back a little way here and there's lots of hairs grow out of that. And as you get older, the hairs start um, becoming rather more obvious. But the hairs are good because they actually filter out small insects and things like that. So they're a very useful filter. And this first part of the nasal cavity is the vestibule. So if you put your finger in your nose, I'm not advising you do that, but if you put your finger in your nose, it will get to that area there. Of course, you should remember that the only thing you should put in your nose is your elbow. In other words, you shouldn't put things in your nose because you can damage it and you can start to start bleeds and things like that. Now, this is the way into the nasal cavity. And then we notice that there's three prominent bones here covered with epithelium in the nasal cavities. And these are the nasal concha, the nasal concha. So the superior nasal concha, the medial nasal concha, and the inferior nasal concha. And we notice that between these here, there are these gaps through which the air can go. So this is the superior meatus, the middle meatus, and the inferior meatus, where the air is going to be channeled back the way when we breathe in. Now these nasal concha, superior, middle and inferior, are often sometimes, uh, or sometimes called the, the turbin turbinates, the turbinates, because they create turbulence in the air. Because all round about the inside of the nasal cavity, it's a mucous membrane. It's actually a ciliated mucous membrane with lots of goblet cells producing sticky mucus. So as the air becomes turbulent, just the right amount of turbulence is created. So we still get a good flow of air through to this back part here, to the pharynx, 
but the air comes into contact with a large surface area of sticky mucus and that's good because impurities in the air are going to stick to the mucus and then what happens is because this all this nasal mucosa here is ciliated then these cilia these hairs are going to waft the mucus in that direction and they're going to waft the mucus towards this bit at the back of the oropharynx and when it's there you can spit it out or of course you can swallow it and it can go down the, the esophagus but it's clearing the air as it goes through and also there's a lot of capillaries just below the surface here as well so the nose is very well perfused with blood so as the air goes through it's going to be filtered by the hairs the turbulence in the air is going to make impurities stick to the mucous membrane and it's also going to be warmed and it's also going to be moistened so warm moist clean air is going to go back now the nasal cavity actually finishes about level with my pencil there finishes level with the pencil there so that's the end of the nasal cavity so the nasal cavity begins there with the external nares the nostrils and it finishes here with what we could call the internal nostrils these are called the internal nares and this is taking the air back into the next part of the airway which is here but of course remember there's actually well there's really two nasal cavities in a sense i mean we only counted as one because there's a septum between the two um, across there in fact these these nasal concha pretty well reach the the septum the nasal septum so it's a bony nasal septum dividing the nasal cavity into two and then from the external nares here the air is coming out of the nasal cavity and it's going into this next area here so from there that's the end of the nasal cavity and that's the start of this next bit which is the nasopharynx so the pharynx is in three parts there's the nasopharynx here behind the nose there's the oropharynx here behind the mouth and then this lower part here below the level of my pencil there from there to about there that bit is the laryngopharynx because you're getting it out down to the area of the larynx so the air is going to go from the nasal cavities into the nasopharynx here passing through and we see an opening there just there into the nasopharynx and this is the opening of what used to be called the eustachian tube but we now call it the pharyngotympanic tube because it goes from the pharynx to near the tympanic membrane which of course is the eardrum so this tube is going to the middle ear the pharyngotympanic tube or sometimes just called the auditory tube but what this does it equalizes the pressure in the middle ear so you'll know yourselves if you're going up a mountain or upstairs or downstairs or driving up and down a hill in a car or if you've been snorkeling or something like that you can feel the pressure in your ears so if you go into water you can feel the pressure really quickly so what we have to do is clear our air clear our ears and that equalizes the pressure between the pharynx which is essentially the outside world and the middle ear so that there's not too much pressure on the on the eardrum so the air is going to go down through the nasopharynx into the oropharynx here and then down into the laryngopharynx so here we have the oral cavity this is the oral cavity here underneath the nasal cavity and we have the top lip the bottom lip top teeth bottom teeth the bottom jaw here this is the mandible this is the cross section of the mandible and this is the top jaw here the maxilla and the maxilla extends back the way like this and it forms the hard palate or the bony palate so this is the roof of the mouth separating the oral cavity there from the nasal cavity above that's the hard palate and this first part is maxilla and this bit at the end here is actually made up of a bone called the, the palatine bone so the hard palate there made of bone rigid doesn't move this back part here this is the soft palate and this is made of uh, connective tissue and there's also skeletal muscle in there and what this does is when we swallow when we swallow that is going to move from that position up into that position like that when we swallow and of course that's going to close off the nasal cavities so that means when we swallow the food's not to go, going to go back into the nose which would be horrible 
So the food goes down the popper way towards, towards the esophagus further down here. So that's the, that's the soft palate. And at the end of the soft palate, if you open your mouth and have a look in the back, you can see that dangly bit that hangs down. That's the uvula, which is the, uh, the lowest part of the soft palate. And of course, this large structure here is the tongue. And the tongue has got the taste buds on top for the gastatory sense. So we can taste things. And then we see under the tongue here, well, it's part of the tongue really, is this large muscle. And this is the genioglossus muscle, the genioglossus muscle. So most of the bulk of the tongue is made up of this fan-shaped genioglossus muscle. There's actually a couple of smaller muscles there under the tongue as well. That one there is called the uh, geniohyoid and that one's called the mylohyoid because they are connecting to this bone here. That little bone just there which is the hyoid bone. So these muscles are attached to the hyoid bone. Now behind this we have the structure here which is guarding the top of the airways and this structure that guards the top of the airways is the epiglottis because the glottis is the opening to the airway so that's the glottic opening there and that's covered and protected by the epiglottis so when we swallow we do not want food going down into the airway we don't want food going down here that would cause choking and asphyxiation because remember the trachea, which is relatively narrow, is the only way that air can get in and out. So when we swallow, what happens is this epiglottis here will fold down the way to cover the top of the glottis. So the epiglottis covers the top of the glottis during swallowing, protecting the airway from inhalation of foreign material. We notice other structures here. Let's just zoom in on those a bit. So here, we know that's the epiglottis. This is the thyroid cartilage, which is the front of the larynx. And this cartilage here is the first cartilage in the trachea. And it's the complete ring of cartilage. In fact, it's just, that's just the entrance to the trachea there. This is the, uh, these are the incomplete rings of cartilage in the trachea just there. So this is the cricoid cartilage. And we notice that the front of the cricoid cartilage is relatively thin, but the back of the cricoid cartilage is, is bigger. And this is called the cricoid arch at the front. And this is the cricoid lamina at the back. Now here we have the essential structures for speech, the vocal cords. So these are the vocal cords here and these vibrate to generate the voice, the vocal cords. But we also have some folds of connective tissue here just above the vocal cords and these are the vestibular folds, the vestibular folds. And sometimes the vestibular folds are called the false vocal cords, but better to call them the vestibular folds. And these are the vocal cords proper. Now the vestibular folds, they're again protecting the upper airway to make sure that foreign material is not getting down into the airway. They protect the upper airway. And uh, immediately below them is the vocal cords and then the trachea. So th this is vital to protect this part of the airway. I've actually got another model I can just give you a slightly different perspective on this with. Um, so this is the top of the, uh, the trachea here. So here we see the hyoid bone. And this is the thyroid cartilage, this shield shaped uh, cartilage. And below that here we have the, the thyroid gland. And here's the, uh, the cricoid ring of cartilage just here. This would be the cricothyroid ligament between the cricoid and the thyroid cartilage. And the cricoid is the only full ring of cartilage in the trachea. And we notice as we go around, it becomes much thicker at the back uh, as it is uh, at the front. So that's the cricoid cartilage, and we see it there in, in cross section. Now, going back up, we noticed that there was gaps in the skull just here. And 
these are called uh, this one's called the frontal sinus a sinus is an airfield space within the skull so that's the frontal sinus there and this one at the back is the sphenoid sinus the sphenoid sinus because this is the sphenoid bone on the base of the skull here and the sphenoid bone here forms the pituitary fossa because that little structure there is the uh, that is the pituitary gland in the pituitary fossa just above the sphenoid sinus and these produce mucus both sinuses produce mucus and that drains into the nasal cavity and if they become inflamed of course they're painful and it's called sinusitis and also draining into the nasal cavity we have the ducts from the uh, from the eyes the nasolacrimal ducts draining tears uh, into the nasal uh, nasal cavity that's good because it recycles the water so the water's not lost and you know that if you if you're crying then you, know, you get a runny nose as well because the the tears are running down into the nose through the, uh, the nasolacrimal ducts and in fact that just reminds us of another important function of the nasal cavities because um, we said that the air is cleaned, warm, moistened on the way in but as we breathe out, the air we're breathing out the, the air we're breathing out through the trachea and up through here up through the pharynx the air we're breathing out is also um, moist, very moist and in some environments we don't want to get rid of that air we don't want to breathe it out so actually as the air is breathed out some of the moisture collects in the nasal cavity as well. So the air breathed out through the nose is going to be drier than the air breathed out through the mouth because the water's sort of recycled. It can sort of recondense in the nasal cavities there. So if you're walking through a desert and you don't want to lose too much water, then breathe through your nose because that's going to collect some of the water as it goes out. And of course, another function of the nose is to smell. So here, round about this area of the nasal cavity, is the olfactory mucosa. Olfactory mucosa. Olfaction, of course, is the sense of smell. And within this olfactory mucosa, we have the olfactory receptors, which detect smell. And that information goes to the brain via the olfactory cranial nerves, the first cranial nerves, taking that information to the brain so we can smell now, of course, as the air is going in and out, especially as the air is going in, there can be bacteria in the air. There can be viral particles in the air, especially attached to uh, water droplets that other people have breathed out, coughed out or sneezed out. So it's very important to protect the upper airway from infection. And there's three particular areas of lymphoid tissue that I want us to notice. An area of lymphoid tissue there, an area of lymphoid tissue just here, and an area of lymphoid tissue just there. Now, first of all, this upper area of lymphoid tissue is called the uh, pharyngeal tonsils. So that's the pharyngeal tonsils there, associated with the pharynx. And then this, this other tonsil here, this is associated with the palate the hard palate and the soft palate. So that's called the palatine tonsils. And if you open your mouth and the tonsils you can see at both sides of your mouth are the palatine tonsils. So when people say tonsils, that's what they usually mean, the palatine tonsils there. Then this area of lymphoid tissue here at the back of the tongue, because it's associated with the tongue, is called the lingual. The lingual tonsils just there. So things to do with the tongue are often called lingual because they're to do with languages. So that's the lingual tonsils. Now the, now the pharyngeal tonsils often become infected in childhood and there can be chronic infection of the pharyngeal tonsils. And when these pharyngeal tonsils are inflamed and infected, we then call them the, the adenoids. So when people have their adenoids removed, it's actually these pharyngeal tonsils that they're talking about. Not quite sure why it's got two names, but these are the adenoids, these are the pharyngeal tonsils, it's the same thing. The best thing probably is to call them adenoids when they're infected and inflamed. So we have these three areas of lymphoid tissue uh, 
protecting the upper airway from infection because if infection gets down into the lungs of course that can cause pneumonia which is unfortunately a common cause of uh, severe illness and death. So there's some of the main structures I wanted to talk about and their functions but the main thing is we've got the nasal airway going through the pharynx, the nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngopharynx, air going in through the oral cavity as well, meeting at the back here in the oropharynx but all the air going down into the upper airway and the food going through into the esophagus. So what this means is that this upper airway here, including the nasopharynx, that is all that is all respiratory, all the area is respiratory. Um, and underneath the vocal cords um, in, the, in this area, all this area here is respiratory. But th that means this area here in the oropharynx uh, is actually shared between air and food. And this is why it's so important that you don't eat and talk, uh, you, you don't uh, eat and talk at the same time. Because if you're eating and talking, then the airway can be open when you're swallowing and uh, that's the most common cause of choking. And the different functions actually reflected in the type of mucosa which is lining these surfaces. So the nasal cavity, as we mentioned, is lined with ciliated epithelium and it's called a pseudostratified columnar epithelium with the cilia wafting in that direction. Uh, in the oropharynx, because there's food going through, there's a degree of trauma so the epithelium here is, is non-keratinized, it's not got keratin in like your skin and your fingernails, it's, it's soft. But it's a, it's a stratified squamous epithelium, which is good for resisting uh, the rough and tumble of eating and swallowing. But then when we get down below the vocal cords, the normal respiratory mucosa is resumed. And again, this is ciliated pseudostratified columnar epithelium and the cilia here of course the clever thing is the cilia here waft up the way <laughs> so so the cilia here are wafting down the way and the cilia here are wafting up the way because you want to get the mucus once once the mucus is in the top of the uh, trachea there you can cough it up through the vocal cords get it into the oropharynx where you can spit it out or uh, swallow it So really quite amazing intricate structures in the upper airway and uh, we are not doing it on this video but all with quite exquisite neurological control of these intricate uh, muscular structures, moving muscles, moving cartilages, facilitating the process of upper airway patency and breathing and also uh, for this part facilitating swallowing as well